Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Roy Evans of the Jericho Broadcast Networks, and I am here with Mr. Darren Reed, who is the Senior Vice President of Stride Professional Development. Darren, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Roy. Glad to be here. All right. Well, thanks. So let's start off by telling the folks a little bit about what Stride Professional Development is. Yeah, absolutely. Stride uh, is a is the nation's leading uh, provider of online education in the K through twelve space. We were formerly known as K twelve Inc. and uh, are you know over two decades in the space of providing um, free virtual online education across the nation to students, no matter where they are. Um, We've since changed our name to Stride uh, because we're, we, we've done expanded beyond the K-12 space, though, though that's still very much what we do as a priority. Um, what we've also done with the Stride Professional Development Center is we've leveraged some of our expertise over the past two plus decades of supporting schools and students and educators, teachers, principals. Um, and we are trying to innovate you know, the way professional development happens for educators. And that we're doing that through the Stride Professional Development Center. Um, gone are the days where, you know, it's face-to-face -face only PD, um, it's episodic professional development, um, it's professional development that's not necessarily relevant to what teachers and educators need right away. So the Professional Development Center is designed to solve that challenge with some unique and uh, innovative uh, ways of delivering content. All right, man. Well, listen, we are super excited here at the network to be engaged with you all and helping to provide this opportunity for teachers all across the country, and especially those teachers that are coming from our HBCU backgrounds, because we Absolutely. know that education was always one of the stalwarts of most HBCUs in this country. They all had teaching programs, and that's what a lot of them were founded for. So, Darren, let's talk absolutely. a little bit about those special programs that you guys have for yeah. the teachers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Roy, you hit, you hit on the very important point. Um, you know, right now in our country, we're facing, facing probably one of the greatest challenges you know, of our teaching core that we have in many, many years. And that, that's around this teacher shortage. You know, a lot of teachers are exiting the profession um, um, just just based on tenure. You know, they're, they're retiring and moving on. And then you have, you know, our existing teachers who are, who are being taxed and stressed, you know, particularly post-COVID with, you know, increasing demands, um, challenges that they're facing in the classroom, and a host of other, other uh, issues that, that they struggle with. And, um, we need good teachers and we need to support the teachers that we have. So the two things that we're doing um, is that we know first year teachers among all teachers are among the first to leave the profession uh, within the first five years. I think they do um, at, at a 44% rate, which is just scary to think that folks are, you know, graduated, want to go in a classroom and make a difference, but, you know, feel like they need to leave within the first five years because it's so challenging. So we want to support them. Um, obviously, as a new teacher, your school that you 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 work, you, where you work your first year, the district where you work, there will be some professional development support to assist you. But we want to go a step further. We want to help every teacher in the country get off to a strong start uh, to their first year and have some uh, stick to it in this, you know, to help them get through that first year. So we're offering a year free um, access to the Stride Professional Development Center. It's an ever-growing online database of courses that will help them in a variety of different ways, uh, classroom management, targeted instruction, uh, and, and a host of other things, and the content will continuously grow. Again, it's just another resource that allows them to sharpen their practice, to feel like they're supported, uh, because the research says that teachers are leaving in large part because they don't feel like they get enough professional support. So we really hope that helps new teachers. So again, this is for any new teacher who just graduated in the country. All you have to do is go to our site and uh, sign on using the Teachers Win uh, uh, discount at, at, at checkout. Also, we have a, a, another campaign where during Teacher, Appreciate, teacher Appreciation Week, we gifted uh, all teachers in the country, no matter where you are, six months free professional development center access uh, but we're doing a special thing with through you, our partnership with the B BCSN and our, our uh, HBCU graduates and, and also the schools that you work with. We want any teacher in the country who, who, who you know, through our partnership um, gets access to the Professional Development Center and they get six months free using the BCSN 23 uh, passcode at, at checkout. You know, again, our goal is to support and get as many teachers on the site feeling supported, um, you know, to really help, you know, them them succeed and have some success, not only for them, but obviously for our kids and the communities they serve. So 
Most definitely. And Darren, listen, we are super excited again to be a part of this. My mother was a teacher. My aunt was a teacher. I have my my best friend is a teacher. So we understand. I've worked in the school system for years. So I understand the resources that are needed. I understand why a lot of these teachers do take the time and they sit there. And after going through college, they're like, you know what? Let's do something different. So we're happy to be a part of this to help you guys change that. So ladies and gentlemen, here's all you guys need to do. All you need to do is take a look and go to the link that's right below us right now and see what you're going to do. You're going to see two links on the page now, just to make sure. The top one takes you to their professional development page homepage that will let you know about some of the things that are happening there and the things that you have access to. Go to the second link that says teacher appreciation. That will take you directly to the content page where you can sign up and get your free year if you're a new teacher and your free six months if you're an existing teacher. Let's show them how we utilize resources and we make sure that we take time for those folks who are HBCU alum and use this. And let's see what Stride has to offer. We're excited about it. We know you will be too. Darren, is there anything else that you'd like to say to the votes? No, I mean, just, you know, as a teacher myself, you know, and and um, understanding the need. Um, and, and of course, with the, you know, the, the diversity that's needed in our teaching core across the country, you know, I know our HBCU teacher graduates are just, you uh, exactly what we need in our community. So I really encourage them and just glad to be doing this partnership with you all. All right. Well, folks, there you go again, Mr. Darren Reed, Senior Vice President of Stride Professional Development Learning. We will be seeing you guys, and trust me, you'll be seeing more from their partnership with us as we move forward, always trying to do our best to make sure that we move forward with the community. Take care. Thank you. I love my HBCU And boy I love it, love it I love it, love it I love my HBCU And man I hope my team they won one 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 I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a lot. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a lot. Yeah, and who the ball? ball? So listen to Professor Yes Sir and pay attention because he gonna teach. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is here, back in the building. How's it going, Mike? I'm fine, Doc. How are you doing? Man, we get Mike back, and then Charles skips out. Charles Bishop on the sign. Something about to eat. Something about to eat here in Houston. With the- yeah, just make people explode and blow up. I tell you, disappear. But we do have none other than AD Drew in the building. How's it going, AD? What's going on, fellas? What's going on? I am so happy to see Mike back for for this discussion that we gonna have today. I need I need that second wheel so that we can go at you, Doctor Cavill. You know, we, we gotta have. Yeah, that second yeah, wheel. we're gonna get in some data matrix today, <laughs> analytics. We're gonna nerd yeah. out. Ho- hopefully, <laughs> we don't pour our viewers too much, but we have lab listeners. We have folks that are prepared and ready for this, so I'm sure they'll get into it and break it down as we get to going as well. Uh, we have Brandon King on here, a new uh, young fella coming in the building. So we're going to nerd him out and see what he thinks as he writes about a lot of this. So uh, we're going to see what he thinks about some of this data numbers representing uh, the independence with North Carolina, uh, Tennessee State. I started to throw you over there with the Aggies. Uh, might be a little <laughs> too much for you to come on. How you doing today? Pretty good. Pretty good. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Doing good. I see you got your exercise in the background, so you're going to make sure we're going to make us look bad. You're going to let everybody know. know that you're staying <laughs> Man, that ain't no but a prop. <laughs> he put that up there for the show. <laughs> he, like, I'm going to be on the show. Let me look like I want the ladies. Hey, Mike, what you say? Turn, turn, around, tell, turn around and blow and watch the dust. Fly. Exactly. <laughs> that, that ain't the powder. That ain't the yeah. powder for your hands, y'all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know the truth. That's for his that's for his son in competition. He just oh, okay. Me. I know. Oh, okay. I Young thought it was, so thought it was one of those screensavers. <laughs> 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 I 
on the <laughs> on the show that's covering the sporting HBCU data, all things HBCU sports for institutions large and small, from the NEIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic program in the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Camille, along with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. As I said, Charles Bishop is out on assignment. We have A.D. Drew, young gun in here, Brandon King, representing for the masses, but we're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to our KCH 230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper in a beautiful home with Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. With that being said, I did want to give a little update. You've heard about our partnership with Teach Appreciation and Stride Network. So I wanted to say, and we'll revisit this even more, but I want to invite inviting first year teachers or current teachers interested in new approaches to pedagogy. You can go to the site, uh, mybcsn.com net backslash watch backslash strides to find out more information uh, on stride so we'll give you a little more about how you can actually get to it but for now if you want to check it out the show go to mybcsn.net backslash watch backslash stride and again i'll give it to you before the information uh before the end of the show with a little more information there with that being said i'm gonna go to you mike since you're back in the building Tell us a little bit about what hot news is on your mind this week in the HBCU man, sports world. Man, I got this all over my social media. I know there's a huge FAMU network that I'm a part of, and it was all it was on LinkedIn. I see also I got to give credit to HBCU sports, but a Florida A&M grad has been named Nike vice president. Uh, I believe his name is uh, G. Scott Uzel. So he's been evidently named vice president and general manager for North America for Nike Inc. This is significant. I'll give him that. He was previously over at uh, president and CEO of Converse, and he was responsible for all aspects of the business globally and successfully. He's had got a good record. He received his MBA from the University of Chicago. He got his bachelor's degree from that itty bitty bitty school in Tallahassee that does the little snake sound. Um, but he's a, a good young man. He led the identification and development of a portfolio of, of high growth brands uh, for the Coca-Cola company. He's yeah, And if you look at his resume, even on uh, LinkedIn, he's got a true background for business, including uh, stints with Cocoa Water, Fairlife Milk, uh, Suji Juice all kinds of business entities. So congratulations to him, but congratulations to an HBCU alum who's made it to the top of one of the, the most well-known sports agencies in the land and in that night. So even though he's from that little itty bitty, 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 bitty school in Tallahassee who claims to sit on a hill and does the snake sounds, congratulations to him. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Ad Drew, since he's picking on the the other hill, as he <laughs> likes to call it, in the bitty. I don't know where what's that about. I'm gonna give you the next segment so you can give us some HBC sports news that you want to share. I, I I need to correct a couple of things. It's not the itty bitty hill, Mike. It's the highest <laughs> of seven hills. Make sure you say that and put some respect. <laughs> On that, on that name, bro, brother. Oh, it's going to be a good one today. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know how you going to follow all this. Oh, my. All right. As, as I come to you from Seattle, Georgia, and I'm calling it Seattle, Georgia, Dow, because it's rained for about 19 of the last 20 days. You know, I thought I moved to the south, not to the uh, northwest. Anyway, let's stay on the fab you thing, everybody. Uh, Florida a and Josh Padilla was named the SWAC SID of the year. And this comes from SWAC.org. Uh, they named him the SID of the year. This was voted upon by the league sports information directors. Let's get a little bit of Josh's background. He oversaw the traditional and digital media for Florida a and this past season. He led the, the Rattlers to another season on multi-million interaction 
with Flo via Florida a and social media platforms. Under his leadership, FAMU has had several video projects garner attention on a national scale. Padilla has nominated six individual league award winners in addition to nominating 31 all SWAC selections. Florida a and earned a weekly honor in 13 sports this past academic year. Padilla served as a primary media contact for the athletics department working with multiple, multiple national media outlets, including the New York Times, ESPN, ABC, CBS, and NBC. I think we got them all covered right there. And, yes, he's, um, and speaking of Nike, Mike, he's also worked with Nike on promoting Fairview shoe release campaigns and worked with LeBron James Media Company, Uninterrupted on a mini documentary which covered the Florida A and M football program. I saw that. Yeah, he's all right. He's okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Because of eighty, do man, don't let Mike uh, get into you. We gonna get in these numbers before both of you. <laughs> Brandon, what HBC Sports News of the Day that's on your mind? Well, <clears throat> this, despite my feelings about the OVC, they they've made it to seventy five years. And they just put out their 75th anniversary team. And Did you there was... have to start it off with that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought we were going for a bad man. I'll have man, man, it, it, you talk, you man, you you talk about one heck of a disclaimer. <laughs> See what kind of to this y'all do to our young folks out there. That's why you got to be right. Look at it, man. Go ahead, Brandon. I, I believe in coming in hot. I <laughs> see. <laughs> But they put out their, their their 75 anniversary football team, and oops, I'm sorry. And there was 11 uh, Tennessee State representatives on there. Now I'm just going to go through them. Um, of course, if you if you want more detail, you can go to my article at hbcusports.com and check it out. So I'll just give you uh, the names. Shameless plug. That was, yes, yes, shameless, <laughs> shameless plug. <laughs> um, we've got. Uh, I like Benny it. Anderson I like it. was a running back from, from 1996 to 1998. Uh, Charles Anthony, uh, running back uh, from 2001 to 2004. Uh, Anthony Bass, linebacker, 2011 to 2014. Uh, Kadeem Edwards, offensive lineman from 2009 to 2013. Uh, Rico Council, defensive back uh, from 2007 to 2011. Uh, another DB, uh, Randy Fuller from 1990 to 1993. Uh, Michael German, quarterback, uh, 2011 to 2014. Uh, defensive lineman, uh, Anthony Pleasant from 1987 to 1989. Uh, Chris Rowland, wide out and slash return specialist uh, from 2016 to 2019. Uh, running back, Javaris Williams. 2005 to 2008. Uh, Dominique Rogers Cromarty, uh, defensive back from 2004 to 2007. And <clears throat> among the coaches that was named was uh, Coach L.C. Cole. L.C. Uh, that's pretty big stuff. Big stuff. Good stuff. Good shout oh. out to you, Tennessee yeah. State Tigers. I like how you did that. OBC besides that. We'll get in a little more stuff about OBC and get into some data. And see your metrics in regards to that. Uh, I want to go a little bit off the beaten path uh, just because of the connection it had. And as a Houston person by a prayer of you, Texas guy already. Um, sad news for those that are in the hip hop, particular uh, in regards to uh, the death of Big Pokey, uh, Houston rapper named Milton Powell. He died on Sunday in Beaumont, just outside of Houston. Um, and he was part of a conglomerate in terms of the screwed up clique that really changed and pioneered Houston hip hop and rap uh, far beyond when Mike and I was listening with the Fifth Ward Boys. And <laughs> Inside <laughs> ways, going out. <laughs> Big pokey. Exactly. With the ghetto boys and the like, and we kind of get into it. And then as we go on face. Triangle. Yeah, already, you know how we say it around these parts. Um, but he sadly died. Uh, he was 48. Um, he passed out on the stage as he was doing an event as part of the Juneteenth weekend. 
But yeah. the HBCU connection, and you can read this even more for those that are not as familiar with it, but those that celebrate the band certainly know about Tuskegee's um, well-produced and well-known Barlin Parlay. That was his song. Uh, his last record called Hardest Pit in the Litter, which is one of the ones that I enjoyed in terms of he came back out, putting it out there. Uh, but yeah, that ball and parlay that the marching crimson pipers of Tuskegee yeah. University, he drew, as you know, really set a lot of folks off and had a lot of folks that really liked when they would hit it up. And that was not just SIEC fans or Division II fans. That were HBC fans and fans at large that would really celebrate that. So uh, just wanted to give a moment and uh, make sure we acknowledge uh, those that cut across uh, the platforms and just how big the HBCU uh, sporting dash, as I like to talk about it, the HBCU sports culture is and how it connects so many people in so many different ways. So rest in peace to Big Pokey uh, Big and Pokey. to all his fans, family members, uh, and, and the like out of the greater Houston. Um, rest in peace in terms of that. I also okay. wanted to can, get into Can I say bit. something on that right quick, uh, sure. Dr. Cavill, on Big Pokey? Uh, talk about that ball and parlay song. I've heard oh, over here in the state of Georgia, I've heard – Caucasian school high school bands playing it during a football game. So that tells you the impact of that song. Oh, yeah. Wow. And, and, yeah. And, and, that, and, and let me add as well, uh, you talked about the ball and parlay, but when you talk about Houston, Beaumont, or the Tri, you're basically talking about one continuous area. And you talk about screwed up click, that's not just music. That's a culture. Now, that screwed up click music, that's a whole genre of rap and culture that he helped create. Sitting, I was joking, but sitting sideways, I went to an all-white Catholic male's high school, and they were jamming that song. Go figure. So you're talking about crossover appeal and having an impact on society. That's in, in, in addition to the HBCU, he had that impact on the Texas, Louisiana, Gulf Coast area, in addition to the HBCU diaspora. Good stuff, good stuff for sure. Now, when we come back on the other side, we're going to nerd out for a minute. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you remember the reports came out on NCA finances, revenue and expenses, uh, USA Today, uh, and then you had some other reports that talked about attendance. And so there's a lot of chatter, a lot of information, uh, out there in terms of social media platforms in regards to what did this mean and what did people think? And people were picking apart different frameworks in terms of what that looks like. You had a great deep dive uh, on the show this past Sunday and previous to that, um, actually it was Monday as they were doing a Juneteenth holiday in terms of Brian and AD. And uh, we even touched on it last week and I gave a homework assignment to AD Drew. He came through with the homework assignment, broke some of it down on his show. We're going to take a little deeper dive and take a different direction. And we're going to break it down into components in this second, third segment uh, to get into some dialogue. Uh, so this is a collaboration for AD Drew. I added some different things on there. So we're going to take various looks. Uh, we'll look at it from a SWAT perspective. We'll look at it from a MIAC perspective. We'll look at it from the independent. So we'll do it at the FCS level uh, in regards to what it means in terms of revenue. We'll even look at it in terms of those teams that played in the championship last year. Uh, we'll look at it in terms of teams, six of the teams that made it to the quarterfinals in regards to what HBCU compare on average to those teams and maybe give you some insight in regards to different ways to cut up this data and look at it to help you consider what it will take for HBCUs maybe to be more competitive in terms of non-conference game. For those that the independents that are looking to participate in the FCS playoffs, what are some augmented ways to look at that? Obviously, uh, you still have the at-large bids for the MEAC and SWAC in regards to them participating in the playoffs, but it'll give you some indications of what this looks like in terms of independent programs as we'll break down the data. Before we take the break, I did want to go into this and touch on a little bit in terms of how we broke down the data. And we'll come back on the side and touch about that a little more. We took all SWAC schools. We looked at enrollment. We looked at um, attendance, ticket sales, revenue, expenses. 
allocated dollars, percentage of allocated dollars, number of sports teams, Commissioner Cup percentage uh, uh, teams, Commissioner Cup, APR. We even have some more data, but those are some basic ones. And again, SWAT, MEAC, uh, and the independent HBCU programs operating at the FCS level. Particulars will be back on the other side, and we'll get into this. We'll have some data matrix to look at it. Uh, we'll have some views that you can see, and then we're going to have some dialogue. So we'll take a break in between all this, and we'll do this for the next couple of segments. Again, we're going to take a deeper dive inside the business side of HBCU sports and see what our listeners think about. See what is be right back after this break. Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk, chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Pika in downtown Atlanta. Them belly full, but we hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. So we've got a Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992. Or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Authentic Caribbean cuisine. T. Madden and Associates is a sophisticated and experienced law firm located in your neighborhood. We're turning injury to cash. T. Madden and Associates obtained almost $2 million for my injury. They turned my injury to cash. Now, we can't guarantee how much your injury is worth, but we've recovered millions for our clients. Call T. Madden and Associates at 833-PAID-123. That's 833-PAID-123. This is Ryan Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yesa yes, and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. This is Dr. Phil with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, A.D. Drew, and Brandon King as we got the young uh, instructor in here today to see what's on his mind, giving him a little <laughs> wet appetite, give him a chance to come here and mix it up in the lab a little bit and see if he can sprinkle some knowledge on some folks uh, in his own way, even though he sounds like he's a little concerned about Tennessee State and OVC, man. I mean, <laughs> swinging it, folks. <laughs> I like I like that personally. So before we get, I know before we get in this number. So Brandon, were you in school when uh, FAMU and Tennessee State were playing in Atlanta, or did you miss all that? No, I was there. I got there in two thousand three, so I was still a part of that. And I, I was oh, so that's there. part of it. You kind of upset while you have the Southern Heritage Classic. <laughs> you still miss missing out on that. <laughs> So I see what it is. You just need a little more flavor, and so you'd be excited just to get that regular. Now, there's some Tennessee State fans out there. I don't want you to get beat up because some of the folks, like, they swear by the OVC, even though they have lost in their conference for over 30 years. But that's a, another discussion. We'll get into hey, that. Hey, Doc. Doc, you got the bookends of the uh, FAMU uh, Tennessee State Atlanta Classic here because I was at the first uh, Atlanta nice. Classic. <laughs> okay, that's how we're gonna do it. Yeah. Let's, let's Bobby Dodd Stadium, 1989. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We just had Juneteenth and belated Juneteenth for everybody. Happy, uh, happy belated Juneteenth. There. Celebrating that history there. But again, we're gonna break down this. We'll look at it in terms of enrollment, um, allocation dollars, attendance, ticket sales, revenue, and expenses. 
uh, dollars allocated. Those were some of the numbers that were out there. If you recall, HBCU Nightly, Joshua Sam Sr. put out there, just took the general number, and he took out in terms of uh, the Knight Newhouse College Athletic Database, looking at ticket sales leaders, where people really got excited. JSU had $4.6 million, uh, and that was from this past year. We'll yep. go a little deeper back because one of the things that's important in terms of the nat- data that we're coming out there, so just so everybody's clear, the numbers that we're using are from 2021 to 2022 season. Again, the numbers that we're going to break down on the show are from 2021 to 2022 season. But as was stated there, just to simplify folks and get you lathered up a little bit, JSU with $4.6 million in ticket sales, with fourth overall in terms of FCS, Southern, $2.13 million was seventh overall. North Carolina a and was $1.25 with 13th overall. Grambling at $763 was 23rd overall, fourth in terms of HBCU. South Carolina State made some pride some folks was $601,000 with 27th overall, but fifth in terms of HBCUs. We'll talk about the next six, Alabama A&M, 593 Texas Southern at 507, the seventh, uh, Alabama AM and Texas Southern were 28th and 32nd, respectively. Number eight was North Carolina Central at 507.3, 33rd overall. Number nine was Prairie View AM, 484, 34th overall. And number 10 was UAPB at 433, at 37th overall. Brandon, don't worry in regards to you know, <laughs> your concern there in terms of not being those t- top 10. Uh, but you were number five overall uh, when you looked at revenue, just overall revenue. So, you know, so there, there's different ways you can cut this up, but you can stick your chest out and be excited uh, for oh. probably the top 10 HBCU FCS programs in terms of how they looked at it. But I want to go to A.D. Drew. It did a lot of the Yolen's work and the homework part of this. And before we kind of give you some pictures and do some cross tabulation and comparison things, I wanted to ask Drew, um, what was some of the things that were important to you that you wanted to look at and why did you take certain numbers and break it down and then start doing a comparison? Actually, it comes down to some of the conversations that we've been having on the show on the various shows as numbers have been coming out. And, you know, we were talking about uh, the Commissioner Cup uh, on one of the shows. And then we started talking about what is, if you really divide that up by the number of sports being offered, how does that affect the numbers on the Commissioner's Cup and and rankings and things like that? So as all these numbers started coming out and – People, when, when when people put out these reports, you got to go to the backstory on them and the back data. And when you click on those links said, you know, this data came from this source, You, re- if you're a stat nerd like me, you really open up and see different things. And thinking about the conversations we've had, and then I'm looking at these numbers, and I'm like, hmm, what about this number? What about this number? Then how does this number affect this number? And you just keep going on and on. And the next thing you know, you you got a you got a big old spreadsheet, and then you figure out, okay, how do I break this down and start coming up with graphs and everything like that? And Doc, if I was if I was about Brandon's age and, did, and had all the time in the world like Brandon does, I would actually sat here and probably try to put together the regression analysis. I know that's over a lot of people's heads, but I think everybody on this show <laughs> understands what I'm talking about to really see if I can actually come up with a formula to see how how does ticket sales or guaranteed dollars or this and that affect your commissions cup standing and, and your points. So that that's kind of what that's kind of where it came from, my economic background and my curiosity as an HBCU sports fan. Well, you know, I like the way you think when you start talking about regression analysis. I even looked at some T-tests, sample size, and we had no, but I'm I'm really freaking everybody out. I'm not going to do all that. Let me go to you, Mike. (laughs) 
just in terms of the data sets, when you saw this number coming out of there and all this busy discussion on uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook in some areas, Instagram, what were your thoughts? Well, uh, to be honest, it, it was a lot of data points, but then I started initially looking, taking, putting that MBA engineering hat on and looking at the relationships, which variables had the most impact over other air variables. You mentioned a couple, revenue, ticket sales, enrollment. Uh, another, uh, another column that caught my eye was percent allocated. Um, if you look at, you know, there's an inverse relationship um, between those institutions or those schools with a higher percent allocated um, than those school than some of those schools with higher revenue. So you kind of wonder why dig deeper. Which schools also factor into this with the highest alumni base? So it, it, it you know going to what uh, Drew said. It just fo focus you or ask you to go deeper and deeper and deeper behind these numbers and see what's the direct and indirect relationships, because this is fascinating. I'm curious in terms of you, Brandon, uh, just from a different perspective, uh, uh, just to see again, you know, when you saw all this chatter taking place and people may not realize, as you said earlier, you write articles on HBC Sports and and in your perspective, one of the things you look at are what are interesting stories. So I'm curious as a columnist for HBCUsports.com, what grabbed your attention when you started hearing all this different uh, numbers and metrics and uh, dialogue was out there? What came to your mind? Well, <clears throat> as I look at it, there's, there's, there's a lot of disparity, uh, you know, just, just taking – you know, ticket sales, for instance, um, since that's just mm -hmm. right in my face. But you look at that, you have obviously you could you could take it a couple ways. You could say there's there's Jackson State and then there's everyone else, um, because what the, the four point six million that they have, you could pretty much take everybody else and, and put them within that. Um, mm. You know, you've got uh, Southern clocking in at a little over half of that, but. Just as I'm looking at these numbers, like I said, it seems that in some cases there's halves and then there's, there's really half knots. There's really a lot of disparity um, with a lot of the numbers. But then when I when I look at it, because like <clears throat> I'm not I, I don't have a, a fancy MBA or anything like that. I, I just got a little bachelor's degree. So. Um, <laughs> but you finished, though. That, that's all. Well, that that's all right. You, I, I you, you got it, though. That's what that's you got that you got that little old degree, right? So I graduated with a 3.3, May See? 7, 9 well, yeah. OPC. Wait a minute. That's right. Talk you, it up. You got the bachelor's degree, but your GPA was higher than my eyes. Go figure it out. And I got the yeah. degrees. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Senior year, I just wanted to be done. I was I was like, look, just I, I'm I'm ready to tap out. I'm I'm done with school. I'm just done. So, Understood. Understood, young man. <laughs> But, you know, like just looking at this, like and, and looking at it from another standpoint, obviously there, there's a lot of there's a lot of, of, of our schools that are below this first bar, whatever uh, metric you want to look at. So what that says to me, there's there's as, as we used to say in the world of retail areas of opportunity. So <clears throat> there's a there's a lot of areas that we can look at and, and look to improve. And, and like I said, we can look and see, well, what can we do? If, say, for instance, I'm just throwing, if I am UAPB, you know, how can we get to, I don't know, 450, 750? What can we do, not necessarily to, to, to get to the 2 million where, you know, a Southern or, or 4.6 where a Jackson State is? Let's get to, to 750. Let's see, what can we do to get there? What, what things can we do to to want to engage the, the community, to want to make them come out. Um, what does that look like? Does, does that look in terms of, of, of obviously getting a better athlete to make people want to come out? Um, mm -hmm. So as I, as I look at it, that's, that's kind of where my mind went to and, and looking at it and just seeing what areas uh, where, where there's opportunities for growth. And, and there it seems to be a lot of. Good stuff. 
But that being said, before we take our next break, Eddie Drew, as we come back on the other side, what are the first things we're going to look at and why? Uh, well, Brandon kind of touched on it. You know, we talked, you talked about those, those ticket sales. And one of the first things I noticed that was out of whack when I saw put these numbers is the percent of ticket sales to total revenue. And when you compare that to everyone else in FCS, what does that really say that, you know, some of some of our teams are way up there. And some of our teams aren't not not even sniffing it. And when we get to the end, there's one number, there's one stat that ties back into that commissioner's cup, Dr. Cavill, that's gonna be interesting for us to look at. But we're gonna hold that to the end to the end of the of the final segment of this. I like the way you think. You learn fast. Stick with us, be right back out of this break and we'll really get into the numbers uh, and give you some data to take home and see what you think about uh, what it means in regards to the FCS data, particularly looking at HBCU. Stick with us, be right back after this second break. Nope. Nope. Come on, him? Ooh, I like him. The Quicker Picker Upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the Quicker Picker Upper. Now you can live in Texas and not have a good red meat blend. Texas Cowboy Dust is designed for steak and other red meats. It's out to be my most popular spice blend, made with onions, peppers, ground mushrooms, pink salt, and other spices. Texas Cowboy Dust also goes great with chicken, pork, vegetables, and has a restaurant quality sheen to gravies and sauces. <laughs> It's like a loot machine. Going around town, trying to get down. Vanilla smoked sea salt seasoning is for seafood. The tarragon and fennel bring out the natural sweetness in seafood. I also use it in rice dishes, on yams, asparagus, blueberry pancakes, and believe it or not, chocolate chip cookies. Vanilla smoked sea salt adds a salty and savory component to sweet dishes that create a symphony for the tongue. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www dot slowburnwaco.com that's www.slowburnwaco.com Press the analytic data with your hip hop If you know them like I know them They gon' tell you if your team If they wanna love laugh And who the ball, who the ball So listen to Professor Yes sir, yes sir And pay attention Cause he gon' teach a lesson This is Dr. Gaville with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with A.D. Drew, Mike Washington, and Brandon King. So let's get into this data. Let's get into some of the numbers. A.D. Drew, what is the first thing we want to look at and why is it important? You know, Brandon kind of talked about uh, ticket sales and the disparity in, in ticket sales and the large gap. Uh, so let's, let's look at ticket sales in the SWAT. And when you take a look at it, this is not the revenue. This is actually the percent of your revenue that comes from your ticket sales. And we see Jackson State coming in at close to 40% of their total revenue is comprised of ticket sales. And you see a couple of those that are way up there. You see... Uh, you see, Southern is is way up there with a with a large amount of ticket sales uh, as its as its revenue, along with uh, Gramlin State. Here's the thing: the FCS average is five percent. So, what does that really tell us? Is Jackson State just that doggone good, where they are 
way up there and 800% better than the average? Or is Jackson State relying too much on their ticket sales for their revenue? What does that number really mean? It's, it's, it's about perspective. So I'll leave it right there and let you guys kind of give you guys a perspective on it. But that was one of the first numbers that kind of stuck out at me. How far above the curve J- Jackson State blew the curve out the water. We'll just put it like that. And I want everybody to notice when we talk about the percentage of that. So uh, when you look at that and you saw the $4.6 million in terms of ticket sales, well, overall revenue for uh, Jackson State that they bring in is $12.8 million. So of that $12.8 million, $4.6 is ticket sales. So when you say the percentage allocated, you're talking about how much of general funds does the university use? And that's why you said that they're all higher in terms of the 40 percent that want other universities. For example, when you look at Prairie View, they spend a a similar amount of money. They spend 14.3 in terms of revenue overall. But they only generate 484 in terms of the ticket sales of that year. Obviously, we're looking at 2022, right? So in terms of them, they use 75 or 70 percent. They allocate more money. So you can look at it two ways. You can either say, as Brandon alluded to, how can Prairie View improve in terms of increasing their ticket sales, right, which would allow them to have more revenue? Or you can look at Jackson State and say, hey, what would be Jackson State's revenue if the university decided to put more money in terms of athletics, in terms of the dollars allocated? So you have to be yeah. extremely careful in regards to just looking at revenue in itself and saying, where is that revenue coming from? Right? Right. 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 Yeah. So and Mike, and, what, what and one, thing before y'all, one thing before y'all talk about that, for the for ticket sales for everybody, this is across the entire athletic department. This is not just football only. Everybody needs to make sure that they understand that. So this football, basketball, if you sell tickets for volleyball or baseball, all sports go into this number. Great point. Go ahead, Mike. No, my, <clears throat> my point was just going to be just the opposite. If uh, If you switch and look at percent allocated, and let's say you pick a number, a line of de- demarcation, 75% allocated. That means, you know, 75% of their revenue is, is allocated. And you look at their ticket sales, then the question becomes, what would that team become if they were able to generate more from ticket sales? They have the capacity. So you look at Alabama A&M, 593000 in ticket sales, 90% allocated. So you wonder if they were able to generate, you know, twofold, one million, you know, how would that help revenue? Then you, I mean, you go down a little further and then you see, you know, maybe a, a couple of schools at 82%, Delaware State, I believe, or maybe one below it was 82%, Delaware State is 92 So you look at those schools with high percent allocated, and then you look at their ticket sales and you wonder if those those schools across the board were able to generate more ticket sales, you know, and, and thus generate more revenue. Is this a, is, is this an HBCU phenomenon that we're seeing or how does this also compare outside in other D1 institutions where you have high percentage allocation with lower ticket sales? Exactly. Brandon. I, I, for, I'm going to come back to you, dude. I want to make right. sure we jump everybody in there because I want you to go to your next yeah. slide and make sure we keep it moving. But, Brandon, I wanted to get into this little th- thought process with you because I wanted to make sure we not only look at the SWAC, we look at a little bit in the MEAC and independence. Highest in the SWAC in terms of total revenue was Southern at $18 million. Now, the dollar allocated of that $18 million was $13 million. 72%. 10 years ago, I did a similar study and they were only doing 40%. So they've had a change in philosophy 
in terms of their administrative leadership, in terms of what they wanted to do to allocate more money towards athletics. I come to you to get outside of this because if you go into the MEAC and obviously the private schools, Bethune Cookman in the SWAC, Howard in the MEAC, and Hampton now in the Colonial, then in the Big South, do not have to report their numbers because of their private status. So I do want you to keep that out in mind. But next to them in the MEAC, the highest amount that is spent in terms of revenue is Delaware State. It's 16.2 million. Similarly, AT spends 16.3 million. Tennessee State, Brandon, that I'm sure that you were really looking at comparing to others. Is that 15.8 million? Well, one of the things I noticed a lot of folks, particularly Tennessee folks, they were comparing themselves to other HBCUs and they were relatively high, top five, if you would, in terms of HBCUs. But my problem with that, I was like, but you play in the OBC, which consists of all other historically <laughs> white colleges that I like to look at it. And the reason I bring that up, because A.D. Drew did a nice analysis, because he looked at the FCS mean. The FCS mean internal revenue is a 17.7. The FCS median uh, for non-football is 17.6. And I should say that was the median. The average in terms of that is different. But I also wanted to look at in terms of the playoffs because those outside, that's a significant thing that you're uh, wanting to participate, obviously, in because that's one of the measures you had. Well, the two teams that played for the championship this last year, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, um, in 22 and 221, if you would, their revenue, total revenue was 25.5 million. It's almost 10 million more. Yep. Uh, uh, then the HBCU average, if you would. Uh, North Dakota State at 29.2 million. Right. If you back it up and look at the public schools that made it to the final eight, I didn't look at the final four because two of the teams were private. So you had the same teams that ultimately made it to the championship. But if you look at the final eight, you had six programs, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, Delaware, New Hampshire, Montana and southeastern Louisiana. Look at their revenue. 25.5, as I told you, 29.2 for Delaware was 40 million. New Hampshire wow. was 33 million. Sam Houston State, 20 Montana million. was 28.9 million. Yeah. And the outlier was Southeast Louisiana with 15, point, 15 million. The average championship games was 27.4. The final eight of the FCS in tournament was 28.8. So I'm always like, how are you going to seriously make a run at the playoffs and be competitive in the OVC, the Big South, if you would, Colonial now in terms of happening, uh, specifically a and because we can look at the public institutions, when you're nearly $10 million behind of what they're spending in their revenue. What are your thoughts when you hear that number, Brent? Well, I think it's 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 really eye opening. It 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 shows that you know how far behind the eight ball in a lot of ways uh, Tennessee State is. And I think to kind of come back to what you said uh, a bit earlier, yeah, you know, because granted, I like like you said earlier, there are some some TSU OVC diehards that will beat me up for saying that, but there there's a fair amount of the, the TSU fan base, if you will, that still look at us like, you you know how maybe when you got in trouble and you had to sit, sit, sit inside and you could look out in the window and see all your friends playing and having fun. That's kind of <laughs> how some of them look at the OVC. Like, you, yeah, you know, we're an HBCU over here with playing with the OVC, but we look out the window and we see Southern – and Grambling playing kickball, and we want to be out there too. So when when we look at these numbers, it's, yeah, we're fifth, we're, <laughs> we're sixth. Well, it looks good, 
But forgetting about the sandbox that we're in, I mean, we're 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 a little fish, and say that when you're operating at almost a, a ten million dollar deficit, that's the reason why. If we're speaking on football, we haven't won the OVC since 1998, and have only been competitive if we're keeping it all the way a hundred, a handful of years, mm-hmm. and. Particularly, I mean, you know, looking at this year, the 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 conference from a football perspective was mediocre at best. Um, mm. So, well, wow. <laughs> no, um, I, I think you you're serious when you say that. You're not saying it just to throw rocks. Uh, yeah. But some of the stronger teams that have finished over the last years in first place have left the conference. What you're talking about, exactly. In terms of expansion, and one of the expansion teams was a Division Two program, and it wasn't very well at the Division Two level. And they're moving yeah. up. It's not to say that teams can't get better, uh, but to your point, uh, the number of teams that made the OBC playoffs was just the one, the automatic bid. Uh, yeah. There were some years where OBC would get multiple players in the OBC into the tournament. So that gives you some indication of what you're saying in regards to the strength that everybody likes to holler at when you talk about SWAC and MEAC. Well, the OBC in this case had the same issue, much like the Big South, when you can only get one team in. Um, so I did want to get into this last break, but before you do that, I did want to come back to Drew and point out another data point and a metric uh, that you can pull up that Roy can pull up and show us uh, as we'll come back on the other side and actually discuss it. All right. Uh, say if Roy goes to uh, number seven. Go ahead and start discussing it. All right, there we go. Uh, that's a breakdown of the revenue for, for the various schools and where everybody's, how, how they get their pot of money. Now, for this, I took out the allocation. I took out what the state allocates to you. And as you can see, going back, picking on Jackson State, as you can see how much of their department's revenue comes from ticket sales, which is the blue line, Compared to everything else. Uh, number two is their game guarantees. Interesting. Look, look, look at the orange one. Those are the those are how much money these institutions are getting off of game guarantees. Mm. And how many of them have the game guarantees as their major revenue source? Such as I hate to pick on your doc, Texas Southern and Prairie View. <laughs> game guarantees were their biggest uh for their biggest revenue source outside of the allocation that they get from the institution. Alcorn, Alabama A&M, same thing. Southern, same thing, which shows how much these people are relying on these gang guarantees. Here's the asterisk to that, everybody. Uh Classics are included in this gang guarantee. This is not all just the beatdown game. The classics, the money that you get paid guaranteed to go to a classic, such as Southern going to the Bayou Classic, is included in that orange graph. So once Fair again, you have to take it. The uh, Great yeah, point. you have to take it with a grain of salt to make sure you understand what's behind the numbers. It's not all bad when you look at it when you when you consider that portion of it. Great what stuff. Is, Great stuff. What, it, what is other revenue? That's everything that wasn't categorized as far as t- ticket sales, gay guarantees was another one. Your payout from your uh, the gray gr- the gray line is if you put that back up for a second, Roy. The gray line is the money that you get from your your playoffs, like if uh, like Texas Southern won the uh, basketball tournament that year. That would be, that would be money that's in that gray line. The money that you get from the conference uh, celebration bowl money, the media contract, ESPN, because uh, uh, I don't believe HBCU uh, HBCU Go wasn't around for this one. So that gotcha. would be that one. And the yellow line is donor is how much you get it from your donors in that particular year. Gotcha. Everything else that they fall in one of those four categories. Went into other just to make it simple. And Thank you're you. right. This is the first year 2022, 2023, when you'll start seeing that money associated with uh, HBCU Go revenue 
uh, it kicked in and paid out at the end of the year. So those checks that SWAT coaches came back, my understanding, pretty much the lowest was a million plus for each institution. Some institutions got as high as $2 million in terms of return dollars from the conference to give you an indication of that next level of what the revenue from HBCU go. And it should increase uh, every year up to the length of the contract with HBCU go. So the revenue payout for SWAT schools will increase significantly over the next 10 years. That is prior to any new contract that will be done with ESPN or uh, if they go to market, whoever else bids on the first rights for the SWAC sports. So um, there's some healthy stuff going on. So it's going to be interesting to look at this year, year over year, as we start looking at longitudinal from this point on, start looking at this data each year. Uh, other thing uh, that was said that I thought was interesting that was put out here, uh, North Dakota State has a very large fan base and their games are almost always sold out and they, they travel well. Great point made by Silas. And one of the things that's interesting is that is when you look at North Dakota State, they're in North, North Dakota and yes, they have a smaller state population, but they are the state institution along with North Dakota. Um, so it makes sense. Yep. It's similar like you look at Texas, Texas A&M being state institutions, and they are able to galvanize the state fans beyond those alumni, alumni uh, that uh, actually went to the institution. You see a similar habit. When you start looking at enrollment, which is something we'll come back on the other side and talk about, it gives you a different comparison in regards to what they're able to allocate in terms of dollar amounts. Because as Drew said, it's not necessarily what the state gives to you because many people know most states, particularly Texas, Florida, do not allow public institutions to use state funds towards allocation of athletics. But your institution has general funds. And a lot of that percentage allocated, dollar allocated, comes from that general fund in terms of how they want to operate their athletics. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this last break. We'll come back and have our last segment uh, as we'll push it forward and give you uh, a couple of final slides in regards to how this aggregates out and multiple ways to look at it and get some final comments to everybody here. Great comments coming in. Appreciate you all. And hope you, you get a little deeper dive in terms of the number of metrics. And we'll come back maybe in a week to give you even some more different stuff uh, to get you through uh, this down period as we get into football, but give you an understanding of why you have to be careful about just taking general numbers and making a declarative statement of the health of your sports program. Stickers will be right back after this break on the other side. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Stride K-12 powered schools are ready to put over 20 years of being a leader in online education to work for you. Dive into curriculum design for the online classroom. Team up with state certified teachers nice. trained in virtual instruction. Take control of your child's education journey. Discover the power of personalized learning with a leader experienced in preparing kids for a future they can be excited about. Take charge. Stride K-12. Enroll now for the fall. You're looking press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot left, and who the ball, ball, ball. So listen to Professor Yes, sir, yes sir. and pay attention because he gon' teach a lesson. This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC Sports Lab. I hope you enjoy as we go into the data analytics metrics of literally really taking you inside the numbers of HBCU athletic programs and resources. Uh, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we gave you the top six HBCU athletic directors, VP of athletics in regards to who was making it work. And now we're going to take you in the numbers and give you some backstories. We gave you metrics, how we come up with that list and let you know the importance of building your programs and the relationships that you had to have. As we had Lynn Thompson, 
talk about the importance of the AD VP of athletics, not only being able to be measured by those five, six outcomes, but how do they have a relationship with the board of regents, the presidents, CFO, uh, and then the community in regards to generating the revenue numbers that you see here. So very important. Before we get back into it, I did want to read this, inviting first-year teachers or current teachers interested in new approaches to pedagogies. Check out the site, mybcsn.net backslash watch, watch backslash stride. Once you load the site, click the stride logo at the top or scroll down to where it says teacher appreciation. This will take you to the sign up page. Then choose if you are a new teacher or a current teacher. There are two different programs, both are free, which vary in length based on your schedule. One last item, sign up. Quote, how would you hear about us? And click on BCSN announcement. Make sure you check out mybcsn.net backslash watch backslash stride for those teachers out there to get some more information in terms of how you improve your pedagogy. But that being said, A.D. Drew, what are some of the final points that you want to make sure people look at and take away uh, as they get into the numbers and we give them their homework assignment in terms of going back and doing stuff after the show? The, the, the next couple of sets are going to be the most important things that I picked up. You guys uh, saw see all the data I presented, so you may, you may have picked up something different. Got, got to give two quick definitions, Dr. Cavill, for the layperson who's not a stat nerd like we are. There's the mean or what common people call the, the average, which is you take all the numbers, you sum, them, you sum them up, and you divide that by the total. So if you have 100, if you have 100 units and you, you do, you've got 10 people, you divide it by 10, and you get an average of 10. All right. Then there's what... We, in the statistical field, we call it the median. That's when you put all the numbers in a row from largest, from smallest to largest, and you look and see what number is in the in the middle. So that may not be that same ten. You may have a bunch of nines and eights, and then you have a twenty out there which skews it, and you have a zero which skews it. So your median may be a number such as eight. And then, of course, there's the last one, and we didn't get into it, which is the bold, which wouldn't work on this, which is the number that would occur most. But I'm getting too, I'm getting too analytical right now. But that's going to help us as we look at this next one, which is going to be, and this came, this inspiration came for you, Dr. Gavir. How much is, uh, does all this stuff cost us? How much does it cost us per sport to compete? I like well, in, in the SWAC, the average cost per sport is se about $735,000. So when, when you think about that, the average cost is $735,000. How many teams are above the average? We're well, statistically saying there's, there's got to be half. But here's the thing. Two teams in the SWAC, two institutions in the SWAC, are spending over a million dollars yep. per sport. Remember yep. the average is 734. Yep. Those two teams spending over a billion dollars are Prairie View and, and Southern. Southern. Let's yep. flip that though, everybody. Let's look at the two teams on the bottom. Alcorn and Valley. What do those two schools have in common, everybody? They're in the state of Mississippi, which goes to show you if Jackson State does not get those ticket sales that we were talking about when we began this conversation, they would probably be down there at the bottom with those two institutions. That was the one thing that stuck out about this. And if Roy would quickly show the BAC and the uh, independent graphic, just so everybody could see the difference with, with those. Your BAC average, just for everybody, is uh, – 667,000 and between the two schools that are independent, it was 663,000. I'll leave it right there, let you guys comment before I give out my closing slide. Great stuff. Uh, Mike, go ahead and take it away. Yeah. Uh, AD, let me, let me tell you, this is some great stuff, brother. I was going where you were. I was going to take a slight spin. 
I was looking at okay. cost of sport. And, and they, then you look at those teams that are above me. You see Prairie View and Southern. Then you look at the schools with the highest revenue. And then you look at one more data point. Who's winning championships the last 10 years? And Ooh. why are there? So you got, you know, JS, you've been competitive. All right. You've got, you look at where, where is FAMU on here uh, and where they are. You've got a t which is right above, right at that 1 million mark. So the question I have is, is there in like the SWAC or let's say the HBCU diaspora, a minimal mark, it, you know, if you given you were able to maximize ticket sales, that you could be expedient with your cost per sport and still be competitive. That's kind of where I was going with this. That's, you got that's 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 where you look. That's at, a good that's point. What I was wanting us and our viewers to pick up on is you could actually create an analysis to tell you what you need to be in terms of your spending to be at the top of your conference. So Brandon, again, I'm going to come to you and this is kind of a follow-up, which means in a lot of ways, North Carolina a and Tennessee State, obviously they have them, but we can look at those two in terms of public, meaning that you're going to have to increase your money two or three times, probably two, two and a half times, North Carolina a and three, three and a half times to be competitive which means you're putting the bulk of that competitiveness either on your students, if you're talking about allocated funds, turn of student fees, and ticket sales from fans and alumni, or uh, you're going to need to find significant revenue to catch up just to be competitive. Yeah. When you hear that, Brandon, what is that? Where do you think you are in terms of making those moves you don't have to be very robust on this, but just a quick thought process in terms of uh, how does that make you feel when you hear that? A couple things. One, it shows that um, to win, it's not cheap. Um, yeah. And you have to, and it kind of goes to your, to your leadership, your administration, and how much of an onus or focus they're putting on, on putting out a, a quality athletic program and, you know, the numbers kind of bear that self out. It seems like those that are geared toward that and, and are willing to, to put those resources out there and look for ways to, to, to build those resources. And then the, it, it's showing itself on the field, on the court. And those that are, you know, trying to cut corners or, or uh, well, let me, not, let me not say that, or, or have certain other constraints that, that may affect That's their right. ability to do that, then, you know, they're, they're obviously struggling as well. So for me, uh, looking at these numbers, like I said, um, commitment to two uh, athletics and then uh, wherever, how, how your, your school, your administration, your athletic department leadership, um, you know, how they, how they, they feel about sports. So <laughs> I, yeah. think, I mean, I mean, you hit it on there. There's no way that you can dance around. I mean, that's important because people are wanting to win. Uh, but you have to decide that you're going to pay at a certain level uh, to win. And you got to be careful. If you only do it in one sport, you might get the bang for that sport. But what is it going to mean to your other sports as well? You got to do it across the board if you want to have a overall healthy program. So it's going to be fascinating to kind of watch again as we stratify this. We do a longitudinal study and do this year after year. It's going to be fascinating. Let me go back to you. Um, AD Drew, as you tie this in a nice bow, I wanted to give some numbers that I added on there that we talked about, but was not able to send back to you, as I'm sure you're going to do it in a great way. I wanted people to realize, and I'm talking about all 12 teams, when we look at enrollment, the highest enrollment in the SWAC, and this is just undergraduate numbers, uh, is Prairie View at 8,444, which helps them with the dollar allocated, I want to make that clear. What helps Prairie View is the fact that they have a growing enrollment. Yep. 8,000. Uh, sex, second is FAMU at 7,000. The average in the SWAC in terms of enrollment is 4,500. 4,587 to be exact. And if you look at that in terms of enrollment 
per allocated dollars, that's 1.6 thousand, almost 1,700. In the MEAC, in, in terms of enrollment, highest enrollment there is Howard at 8,964. Again, this is undergraduate enrollment only, almost 9,000 students. But in terms of a public institution, it's Morgan State at 7,000. Their average is 4,629 students. But in terms of allocated dollars, they're doing 2,580. Again, let's compare this to the two public institutions. Obviously, uh, A&T, undergraduate enrollment, this is 2021 20, numbers, is 11,596. Tennessee State is 6,035. Average, when you include Hampton, is 6,946, almost 7,000. They're doing 1.5 or 1,561 uh, per allocated dollars. Again, you look at that across the peers, you talk about average attendance for the championship, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, 10,000 students. So this that game in terms of understanding the value of enrollment, but I want to make sure clear, you got to get your enrollment up. But to get your enrollment up, as we see last year, as we have an interest in HBCUs, you also have to have the bedrooms. You have to have the beds. And unfortunately, a lot of that money comes from the state. So there's a state component about this that's political that we need to understand that there is some hand tied with our leadership and understanding how to make all this work. A.D. Drew, take it away and close it out uh, as I hopefully we've given some significant numbers for people to consider. But I know you have some a couple of slides that you want to show that really ties this in a nice book. We're going to go to 13, then 14. Uh, too bad. Couldn't pull this one out for the independence, but let's look at the Commissioner's Cup. You know, that's what you play for in the swag. And then the MEAC is called the All Sports Championship. We'll come back to the All Sports, uh, to the MEAC in just a moment. In 21 22, uh, Prairie View won the Commissioner's Cup. With 167 points. I'm gonna just give you the top four. Alabama State was number two, 146.5 points. Texas Southern was three, 121.5 points, and Southern was four at 119 points. The average amount of points when you divide your budget, how much you spent by your score in the commissioner's cup, how many points you earned in the commissioner's cup on average. It costs you $109,000 per point in the SWAC. Well, look at the teams above that average. Alabama State, over $120,000. Let's see, Alabama State, $122,000. Te Texas Southern, uh, right at the average, $109,000. Southern, $156,000. And... uh. Preview, one hundred and twelve thousand dollars. Like you, like y'all just said, you have to pay to play. Those teams that spent at the average or above had a good chance of winning the SWAT Commissioners Cup. Those who did not didn't. Poor Alabama A and M did did not invest their money good because they spent more money than anybody and was was way below the Mendoza line. And it's the same. It's the same thing in the BA. Those who paid, those who paid the money for the all sports uh, trophy in in the BA, it was one hundred and fifty five thousand. Was was your average? And I, I'm going to try to be uh, quick with this. Uh, the team who won the uh, all sports trophy that year was Howard with one hundred three with one hundred three points. Obviously, we can't look at. Howard, so we have to go to the next team, which is Norfolk with 93 points. As you see, they, they are they are above the average. And coming in at number three in the BAC was, was Morgan State this particular year. And that's combining men's and women's. And as you can see, those are the teams that are way above the average. Good stuff. Good stuff. Great reports. Go back and check out the show uh, from Monday for Brian and AD. They take another dive. Great slides they have near the ear of that, uh, end of that presentation that breaks down the revenue distribution of the SWAC, uh, the MEAC, and the independence in regards to looking at 
other revenue, donor, NCA, conference media, uh, money, game guarantees, dollars allocated in ticket sales. It gives you a great indication of where various institutions are looking at in terms of what that dollar is. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this breakdown to give you some indication. I know it was heavy in terms of the data, but sometimes you got to go do your homework and you just got to really break down the numbers and look at it in such a way that you get a better understanding in terms of athletics. This also gives you a different viewpoint in regards just uh, what is the challenge in the depth of how you have to really understand the metrics associated with running a top level athletic program. With that, I want to say thanks. Thank you for listening to Inside HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our, our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of HBC Sports. Come from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Now you see why I got my first nickname, the Data Doctor. Uh, but you see A.D. Drew, as well as Mike Washington, Brandon King come in and understanding in terms of those data points and economic frameworks and Brandon uh, uh, holding his end of the bargain up very well, even though he kid us a little bit. Uh, you did well, Brandon, in regards to providing a perspective in terms of just analytics, in terms of writing the analysis of what are your thoughts when you hear these numbers. And that's important to make sure we bring to the table as well. Again, I want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bills Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. We look forward to next week as we discuss the latest news in the lab. We start getting to the point where we can give some updates and we'll look at the rankings uh, coming up really quick. Where we'll look at Division II NIA programs, look at the top 21 teams, tell you where we think they are standing coming into the season. We'll have a flashback and tell you how wrong or right we were. We'll also do it at, at the FCS level. Where we know we have a lot of interest to see. Uh, when we'll look at those 21 teams, which means in that level, we'll get to see all FCS 21. But follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Again, that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter. Facebook and YouTube is Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you... Check out Brian and AD every Sunday, sometimes on Monday. Just check them out because they moved a little bit in terms of the summertime uh, in regards to sports rap. They'll keep you on the lookout as they bring extended show. We might even do a guest on there and do an even more extensive breakdown on their show when we talk about it. Make sure you talk out, check out Brandon King, uh, Sneaker King. Also, his articles at hbcusports.com as he gives it to you. And as Mike does his data analytics and data points and matrix, as he likes to do, as he uh, does his stuff. Look for them, uh, those Prairie View fans out there with 1876 Sports and Coaches. They'll bring that back shortly as they get ready for the fall season to give you an update on Prairie View News. ONG Strike Zone, as they do it every Wednesday. Obviously, Carlos Brown this Saturday as he gives you the latest news of what's going on in Southern and HBC landscape in terms of what he thinks. Uh, Swack and goes outside it and talks about some pro sports, especially his favorite with Miami Heat. Uh, didn't quite get it done, but they made a hell of a run. Shout out to Carlos Brown in terms of his Miami Heat. Uh, with that being said, dream big, continue to move forward. We'll talk with you soon. Mike? Of course. Drew? Travel light, everybody. Lecture? Brandon? Dismissed. You want it, brother? <laughs>